Uh, our guest in this segment is Senator Jason Barrett. Good morning, JB. Good morning, guys. Uh, a couple of things to get to. First and foremost, though, the uh, Tudor's Biscuit situation, Jason. I understand you had a soft opening that was uh, quite uh, uh, quite well, uh, well enthusiastically greeted. Well, we, we attempted a soft opening. Let me, re- let me <laughs> say it that way. That uh, was the last Thursday we uh, opened for the first day, and uh, Wednesday evening, one of the, the – folks that work for one of the contractors here uh, took it upon himself to let everybody know that we were going to open Thursday morning. So uh, we were greeted at 5 a.m. with uh, uh, quite a few customers, uh, both uh, at the front door and in the drive through and um, it's been crazy busy ever since, and the community's been uh, extremely supportive and um, uh, very appreciative. Well, Jason, I want you, this is John, I, I want you to know that I saw your name, Rob sent out a list of who's going to be on the show the next day. I saw you were there, so I skipped breakfast. I thought you were going to be in the studio. Yeah. So along, along, well, the, along the same line, Jason, you know we're having this open house on Friday, inviting the folks that listen and participate in the chat room to come and meet in WRNR. It's been suggested that you will p- be providing biscuits for that open house. <laughs> Well, I, I can certainly work something out like that. Just Bill, just text me over your credit card number, and I'll have them there for you. <laughs> Bill was the one who suggested it, just so you know. <laughs> but I, I did suggest, but I'm using John Gilstrap's credit card. <laughs> <laughs> I don't care whose credit card. You use. <laughs> uh, it, uh, I, I just sit back and enjoy those two having their their moments there, Jason. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, anyway, it was supposed to be, as you said, a soft opening. It, it, it was otherwise uh, greeted with uh, great enthusiasm. Have you run out of inventory? Uh, there were a few things that uh, we ran really tight on and, and were out of for, for a brief time. So we get our uh, deliveries here on Tuesdays and Fridays. And, um, you know, we're in a little bit different situation than, than the other 75 locations. Uh, well, 74, the one in Panama City has a lot of the same issue that we have that, um, you know, we're so far away from all the rest of them. It's not like that, you know, if I run out of uh, a certain product, I can't run down the, sh- you know, run down the street or across town to the next tutors and borrow it from them the way that uh, so many of the other locations across West Virginia are able to do. So uh, good for you. That's, it's amazing the uh, the community is supporting it uh, that well. And I hope your supply chain uh, is, is an endless supply of quality products, sir. Well, thank you. You're quite welcome. Hey, uh, I want to ask you about interims, and then I want to get to this okay. uh, Senator Karn situation here because he'll be our next guest. Uh, but first, the interim uh-huh. sessions, and uh, jails is a committee that you sit on, and you have uh, been our pipeline for information as to what this state is doing to try to correct some of the problems there. What do you have for us? Well, yesterday we had um, uh, Homeland Security Secretary Mark Sorsea as well as uh, Corrections Commissioner uh, Billy Marshall, uh, who has been to our committee, uh, the, the Oversight Committee on, on uh, Jails, uh, a number of times. He is new to the position. Uh, and quite frankly, um, in the, the discussions in, that I've had with, with Commissioner Marshall, uh, his presentation to the committee, uh, everything that I've heard and seen, um, I think he's, he's really doing a good job there no question issue in, issues in corrections in our facilities that we needed to, to correct and uh, they came yesterday to, to kind of talk about how they're they're moving forward uh, not only with uh, conditions but uh, as well as uh, filling the vacancies uh, as you'll recall uh, during the, the the peak of the vacancies um, for corrections it was well over a thousand uh, positions that were vacant. Uh, it's it's still over 800. There's still a lot of work to do, but uh, some of the, the steps that, that have been taken have, have certainly helped, and uh, the pay raise is one of those things that um, you know we were able to implement and do. The other idea, actually, uh, that has been successful and, and Commissioner Marshall talked about yesterday was in the past when uh, corrections would hire uh, a, a, corrections, a new corrections officer, they immediately sent them to the academy uh, at a cost of around $16,000 to the state to give this person the, the adequate training uh, necessary to, to be a, a, a corrections officer. Um, now we are uh, giving them some on-the-job training, for lack of a better term, uh, for the first two to three weeks just to see if, uh, if, it's, uh, if they're a good fit uh, and if they like the job and it's something that they uh, are willing to stick with. And uh, that idea actually came from President Blair. 
um, in a meeting that I was in uh, just through discussions. There were a number of us around the table, and um, you know that's, that's how some of these things work out. And um, you know, so I think that, that that's been a successful uh, change uh, in helping um, you know get qualified people in there and make sure the state doesn't. Um, you know, spend sixteen thousand dollars to train somebody that's not going to be there but a week or two because they realize the job's not for them. Bill, yeah, uh, Jason, the uh, the incident that we had in the southern part of the county and one of the jails there, uh, did that surface yesterday in the discussion with the uh, commissioner? The, the southern part of the state, yes. Yes, yes. Um, I'm sorry, state. We 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 talked about southern a little bit, and um, several members of the committee did ask questions. Uh, I asked a few. Um, there have been a number of investigations uh, around Southern and around uh, some of the other allegations. Uh, and, and again, our current secretary and uh, commissioner were not in those roles during those times. Um, but, uh, you know, they were able to talk a little bit about it. And one of the things that I asked Commissioner Marshall was about, about was that, um, the investigations that have been done, uh, were they done properly? And, and I just asked him to talk about how those investigations were conducted. And uh, Commissioner Marshall has an extensive background uh, as an investigator. Um, and it turns out that um, some of the uh, the inmates that were interviewed uh, were handpicked by certain superintendents and um, because I think they, they knew that, that they would say what, what what they wanted them to say and so i don't think those some of those investigations were, were above board i don't think uh, that some of those investigations really um provided the necessary um information that that should have been and uh it really seems now that that we're getting on the right track with that um it, it's important number one for the safety of our employees uh it's important for the safety of the inmates and um, you know, they have to have uh, conditions in our jails and prisons cannot be inhumane. And I'm certainly not suggesting that it's the Ritz-Carlton. Uh, these folks are incarcerated for a reason, uh, but they shouldn't be in inhumane uh, situations. Um, and the, the $4 million settlement that the state uh, has agreed to um, is $4 million of taxpayer money uh, that's essentially being wasted. And, and so I think that's, you know, the role of this legislative oversight committee uh, is to make sure that, that the state agency is doing uh, and taking all the necessary steps to, to ensure that we don't get in a situation like this again. Yeah, I'm troubled a little bit about the uh, uh, the Metro News article, which you, you're quoted, I think, in a very positive sense. Uh, but the uh, Secretary of Homeland Security, talking specifically about the Southern Regional Jail, says, I've never seen a jail in better shape. I couldn't find any problems. I couldn't find a problem to write down. I'd have to look look for one. Uh, that's pretty glowing terms for a facility that has just been under the spotlight saying there were some gross uh, difficulties. Can you reconcile the two? Well, and I've, I've, and I'm not saying that I was surprised by Secretary Sorsea's comment of that. I think what he was trying to say is that there was a problem and it's been addressed. Uh, there's been a lot of money, there was a lot of money appropriated by the legislature this past session uh, to go to deferred maintenance of our prisons. Uh, and it, it seems that they're deploying that money in, in the appropriate way. They have um, invited us a number of times and I've attended uh, some of the facilities in the past uh, for legislators to go see and, um, you know, firsthand. And, um, you know, I've made it clear to them and they've agreed that uh, when we do that, this is not going to be something that we plan weeks in advance and you prepare for us and you get everything spick and span and, and everything looking great for us to come tour that uh, if we want to do this uh, very spontaneously, um, that's the way we want to do it. And, and they've agreed and, and said in committee yesterday that they had no problem uh, any time that any, any member of the legislature or that committee wanted to go to our facility, they would make it happen. Hey, Jason, yesterday we had uh, Kenny Matthews on the show. He's the West Virginia Criminal Law Reform Coalition, I think is the name of the group. Mm -hmm. And he introduced something by way of, of easing the pressure on the jails. He uh, talked about something that I had never heard before, which he calls second chance or second look sentencing. Are, are you familiar with this? It's for 12, there are 1,200 inmates in the state older than 50 who, who were convicted in their 20s and are essentially new people you know in, entirely different than they were at the times they've convicted they were convicted of their crimes in this second look sentencing we give an opportunity for judges to perhaps show mercy and and reduce uh some of the sentences and letting people out are you familiar with this at all 
I, I'm familiar with the term. Uh, I'm not familiar with the program and exactly how it's implemented or, or who, who qualifies. Um, you know, certainly someone that it was convicted of murder one, I'm sure would not be part of this, I wouldn't think. But uh, so I, I don't know what what crimes or, or which inmates would qualify for that. Um, but it is a term that I'm aware of. But that's to be honest, that's about the extent. A program like that, and I'm, I'm not touting its merits because I don't really understand it either. But is that something that would start with legislation? Well, I don't if legislation was required, um, you know, I would assume that most of those um, folks that have been there for 30 years are eligible for parole. Um, so I'm, I, I would be interested in hearing how this program uh, is somehow different than a parole process. I can't answer that. I don't know. Yeah. Jason, going back to the regional jails itself, uh, this is dated information. I've not had firsthand experience uh, in the last several years. But for a while, the Eastern Panhandle, Eastern Regional Jail, uh, rather, uh, had a turnover of director uh, every f- six months or six or seven months. Is that still the case? And if that is still the case, how can you ensure any uh, level of responsibility with that rapid turnover? Well, I don't, I don't know how long the, the current superintendent has been there. I, I, I just don't know. Um, I know that, like you said, in the past there was a good bit of turnover. Um, it is a very difficult job. Um, a lot of these jobs don't, don't pay overly well uh, as compared to um, a similar role in, in a border state here in the eastern panhandle. Um, and, and that's why it was important for us, this legislation this year, uh, that when there are vacancy rate, I'm sorry, you know, when there are vacancy rates uh, that are very high in uh, certain or in any of the facilities, that there could be additional pay uh, to help with that. It wasn't really a locality pay. It wasn't based on um, cost of living. It wasn't based on housing. It wasn't based on um, market rate of similar jobs. It was based on um, the vacancy rate uh, of of the officers uh, in any given facility and that was a way to get it passed and, and certainly um, you know or, or it may have been more like a ratio from inmates to uh, to to officers but but in the Eastern Panhandle ERJ we're always going to have those problems because of our increased population because of the competition that employees have uh, in other states. Jason Barrett our guest a uh, member of the state senate which apparently yesterday there was a vote to remove Robert Carnes, Senator Carnes, from the caucus. Uh, Were you part of that vote, Jason? What can you tell us about it, if anything, and what does that mean? Uh, That was on Monday. Uh, That was done inside of the Republican caucus. That was the vote that was taken, and that was the decision that was made. That's what I can tell you about. What does it mean to be removed from the caucus? You can explain that for Uh, sure. (laughs) Yeah, I absolutely can explain that. So the, the, the Republican Senate members, we caucus every day at 7.30. Um, and we have, well, I have this past year, and they've been doing that for a number of years. Um, and it's a time for us to get together to go over uh, the agenda for, for all committees that day, to have uh, open and frank discussions with one another about where we are on specific issues, um, and where sometimes that where we may differ from the House um, and you know, working towards negotiating with them. Um, and it's important that what is said in that caucus, um, that we are able to keep amongst ourselves and um, not to be uh, spread out, uh, whether it's, you know, with other House members in the public or something for the media to misconstrue. Uh, it's kind of a safe space for us to be able to have a very open dialogue with one another. Does Senator Blair chair the uh, informal daily caucus? No, uh, Senator Nelson is the chair of the okay. caucus, and I'm the vice chair of the caucus. So to be voted out of the caucus means that you cannot attend those caucus meetings in the morning any longer? That's correct, uh, or receive any caucus communication. Did you vote on that? It was a vote uh, within the caucus. Were you at present at yes. the caucus? Well, the, the, yes. Um, there, I believe there were maybe a handful of senators that were absent. All right, so did you vote to remove? Yes. Okay, and what were your reasons for that? Well, I, I think I've outlined kind of what we uh, look for in the caucus, and that is to have 
um, you know, a, a safe space to be able to, to do that. And when things are shared uh, within that caucus um, that undermine uh, the the will of, of the majority of the caucus, um, you know, that's that's not acceptable. All right. So apparently he had published some information. I know there was information involving Tom Roten that apparently was on a site and I guess has since been taken down. And I'm assuming you're alluding to that or were there also previous incidents? Yeah, I don't I don't I wouldn't expect anyone to um, be removed from caucus from one one example. I mean, there are times when. You know, you you know, there, we have so many conversations throughout the day, and you know, there there's so much back and forth, and you know, sometimes you don't remember where you heard something, and if you know somebody inadvertently said something that was said in caucus, but there was no malicious intent, and you do that, you know, once. I mean, we're not going to throw you out of caucus for that, but uh, I think that when you're deliberately trying to undermine the will of the caucus, um, you know, that poses a problem. There's been an interesting argument that has developed between Republicans since they've taken the supermajority, Jason, as to what a real Republican is and what and who is a real Republican and who is not a real Republican. You have to be aware of this as a member of the Senate. Can you define for me what a real Republican is these days? Yeah, I think someone that, that looks for less government, uh, someone that supports a uh, free market, uh, someone that supports, um, you know, family values, whether that's through, um, you know, being pro-life. Um, uh, I think all of those things, uh, supporting the Second Amendment, there are, there are a lot of those things. Um, but there are there seems to be a group of folks, um, whether it's in the Senate or whether it's just, um, you know, a, a, a Facebook page or or, or just a, a group of, uh, you know, some some type of group or organization that um, they take this mentality that if you don't agree with them 100 percent of the time, you're not a real Republican. And um, I think that, um, you know, I, I think that it's a very small vocal minority of people that, that operate that way. And, and we all have different backgrounds. We all have different views of things. Um, and, you know, if most of us, you know, agree 90 uh, percent of the time. Uh, but if there are a couple issues that, that we look at differently for different reasons, different life experiences, education background, whatever it may be, um, that, that there are some folks that, that have no understanding of that and they just want to call everybody a rhino and, you know, make up a bunch of false out, uh, accusations. And, and that's not good for um, the Republican Party in West Virginia. And that's not good for, for the people of West Virginia. This, this Republican-led legislature... Um, you know, has really moved West Virginia forward in the past few years. And I don't think you can deny that. But um, just because somebody doesn't agree with you 100 percent of the time um, doesn't make them uh, a liberal, doesn't make them a rhino, doesn't make anything that, that, that some of these folks out here um, come up with name calling and, and all this stuff. I don't have any time for that nonsense, to be honest with you. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm busy every day doing things. Um, Charleston is 307 miles away, uh, and when I go there, uh, I do the best job I can for the people of West Virginia, and I know that's what the majority of the legislature does. But there are a few uh, that are just um, want to be difficult, uh, want to rock the boat, uh, and just uh, are just there to cause trouble, and I don't have any patience for that. Yeah, Jason, there's no secret that uh, uh, Senator Carnes and Senator Blair have uh, uh, had had difficulty with each other uh, in the past several several last session anyway. Uh, do you anticipate that this disagreement, this personal animosity toward each other, will carry over to the upcoming election, specifically because Patricia Rucker is an ally of Senator Carnes? I don't see any scenario where the two of them are going to be um, have a better relationship that's about all I, that, that, I, don't, I don't to be honest I really don't know how to answer the question um, um, Senator Blair is going to continue to lead the caucus the way he has uh, in I think a very effective way in a very open way where everybody uh, has a voice and a say and um, you know I the, the, the caucus is really driven by the members. The agenda is driven by the members. Um, and so uh, I, I would anticipate our caucus being very united, moving forward um, 
with a very pro-West Virginia agenda. Do those senators who call themselves members of the Freedom Caucus caucus separately from from the Republicans? I have no idea. I have no idea what they do. And I don't know what senators are in the uh, Freedom Caucus. So I, I couldn't tell you what they do because I don't even know who they are, if, and, if there are still any left. And I don't even know that they, most of them don't identify publicly. We had it in the House. We had a show on that not too long ago. It kind of reminded me of the, the stories I heard about the 50s and the communist hearings in D.C. about Hollywood, which was uh, who's a communist and who's not a communist. Only now it's who's a Freedom Caucus member and who's not a Freedom Caucus or, member because some of them won't identify because they say if they do, then they get met with discrimination in Charleston. And going back to earlier than that, the Ku Klux Klan, very similar. I have a feeling they could call us in a minivan, but I don't know who they are. <laughs> All right. Uh, uh, Jason, uh, uh, finally, uh, anything else out of this interim session uh, that uh, you want to bring to our attention that took place? We did have some discussions um, in the Pensions Committee uh, regarding 911 operators. And you'll recall a few years ago, uh, I introduced a bill on behalf of the paid firefighters of Berkeley County uh, to move them from the Public Employee Retire System, PERS, over to the EMS uh, uh, retirement, which is a b better plan and more suited for someone in the line of work they are. In that bill, we also um, allowed 911, new hire 911 operators go into that retirement. Uh, what we're trying to do now is come up with a way to allow existing 911 operators to go from PERS into the uh, EMS retirement. Uh, and there's, there have been votes uh, among uh, the organizations in the different counties. I think it'll move now to a vote of, of all the 911 operators. Uh, there's a, a cost associated with that, which the county could pick up uh, is one option. The individual, I think, could have the ability to uh, pay a certain amount of money uh, to kind of get caught up, or they could uh, maybe uh, have a, a different uh, certain years of service. For example, if you have 15 years of service in PERS and you want to move to EMS, you know, maybe the, the ratio or the, the, the way that that would change could be down to maybe 12 or 30. That's just off the top of my head. That's not anything set in stone. But so we're working through that to, to ensure that we can get these 911 operators who have a, a very stressful uh, job to do to be able to get them into the EMS system uh, for those that are, that, you know, have been hired in the past and not just the new hires. Any final questions for Senator Jason Barrett? Good. Thanks, Jason. Jason, thank, thank you, you very much, much man. All right, guys. Thanks. Take care.